Welcome to SuccessWorks, your partner in success. If you are someone seeking success in your life and career, subscribe to our channel and use our videos to get some great inputs on how to earn more money and live a better life. You're like an athlete. You're an athlete. Yeah. You're in shape. Yeah. Right? You're not going to have a reaction in your body like somebody who doesn't take care of themselves. Right. So, you know, I believe I don't believe in emotional intelligence. I think it's useful, but I'm mm. more interested in emotional fitness because mm. intelligence is a capability. Fitness is a state of readiness. Interesting. If you are fit, you can take that demand right now and you can deal with it. You can deal with that physical stress, that emotional stress. Same thing's true with psychological fitness, emotional fitness, right? So I'm, I'm pretty fit. And part of that is not because I'm so smart. Part of it is that I've taught this for decades. Yeah. I remember I had a woman who came to one of my seminars in, um, in her, I don't know, early 80s probably. And she would run in this room, five, 10,000 people. I think it was, you know, she went a couple of 10,000 person events. And she would get in this front row and fight her way through there. And she'd jump and go for it. And at one break, she came up to me, I was signing a book for her, and she says, uh, she goes, Mr. Robbins, I've seen you at like eight of these. She goes, <laughs> I've seen you like when you're really, I know, I can hear your voice, uh -huh. you're hurting, or you haven't slept. And she goes, you always seem to be so up all the time. How come right. you're so up? And I said, well, part of it is I attend all these seminars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm teaching it. So I, there's a fitness of that. But there's also, you know, I've, I've buried three fathers and, and one mother, and, you know, mm. that affects your life. I've, uh, you know, I've had a, physician look me in the eye and say you have a tumor in your brain wow. and so I've had those moments that when you've had extreme stress and you push your way through it you build psychological muscle yeah. it's like it takes a lot to knock me off you know in the early days we didn't have fifty thousand dollars keep the doors open how do we do it then I had you know graduated to five million and I graduated to uh, a partner that and mine who kind of didn't do things well and I ended up owning a hundred million dollars because I had to take on his debts uh -huh. hundred million dollars and, but when you do all that stuff, you know, now my companies do five billion, you know, right. a year. So uh, you, you, you keep expanding what I would call really the circle of your, th the threshold of your influence. Sure. You know, everybody has a threshold of control. And if you get beyond it, you kind of freak out. So it, it takes a little bit more. I don't have, I can't so you don't have breakdowns. I don't have a breakdown. I mean, do I get pissed off or get frustrated <laughs> or tired? Yeah, but a breakdown, honestly, no. When I've had uh, challenging times, I mean, I have so many tools. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I pull them out. It's, and mostly, it's, it's just like you as an athlete. You know, you don't just physically break down. Right. right? You take care of yourself. So I'm constantly I think, training that. I think muscle. most people don't train their mind and emotions. It's like mm -hmm. I think the most powerful muscles to me are not physical. They're as strong as important as they are. It's like faith is a muscle. Courage yeah. is a muscle. Determination is a muscle. Playfulness is a muscle. You know, passion unexpressed weakens. You know, faith untested gets smaller. Yeah. So uh, I'm always. I, I call it deep practice. I'm always pushing myself to the edge, yeah. and pushing yourself to the edge makes you stronger. Yeah. You know? Well, uh, Sir John Templeton is probably one of the greatest investors in history. He, people don't know his name. Uh, he started out with nothing. Um, mm -hmm. He wasn't Sir. He wasn't from another country. He came from the U.S. <laughs> and he decided that he wanted to understand wealth, and so he saved ten thousand dollars, a huge amount of money in those days. Mm -hmm. And when Hitler invaded Poland, he developed a belief. And his belief was, you make your money in times of maximum pessimism. Like if you were around in 2008, really? eight, nine, you yeah. remember what it was like, right? Yeah. You could have bought, you know, the Sands in Las Vegas. You could have bought their stock for two dollars and twenty-eight cents today at sixty-seven dollars. Wow, it's a three thousand percent return. It's not bad. Um, you could have bought uh, Citibank for less than a buck, mm. right? So people in those times, he understood that, and so what he did was, and everybody thought the world was going to end. He took ten thousand dollars. He bought every stock on New York Stock Exchange that was a dollar or less, including companies everybody thought were going bankrupt. But we, when things are bad, people think it's going to be bad forever. When right. things are good, they think it's going to be good forever. And they're always wrong. Life's cyclical. So there's a season for everything. So mm -hmm. once we got through World War II and went a few years later, guess what? Those same stocks made him a billionaire. So when I asked wow. him, I said, what's the secret to wealth? His response really touched me. He goes, you know it. You teach it. I said, what's that? He said, gratitude. And I said, why do you say that? He said, because if you got a billion dollars and every day you live pissed off and frustrated, the quality of your life is called pissed off and frustrated. <laughs> right. But if you have nothing, but you're euphorically grateful for whatever you have, you're the richest person that you're going to know. He mm. said, so it doesn't matter how much money you got if you don't have gratitude. So I do the same thing, by the way. I have a process I call it priming, where I get up every mm. morning. I do mine in the morning. I just radical change to my body, kind of alter my state. And then I do 10 minutes I never miss. And my first three and a half minutes is what I'm really grateful for. And I make myself think of at least one of those three that's something really simplistic. Yeah. Instead of something giant, you know, the wind right. on my face, the yeah. look in one of my kids' eyes, you know, something of that nature. And then I do three minutes of strengthening healing. And then I do three minutes of when I'm going to create my world. And I do that for a minimum of 10 minutes yeah. every day. Because I believe you have to condition it. You don't just mm -hmm. hope that stuff shows up. Well, I don't know what's a bad joke. For me, it's not a joke just another device 
to make them see something. Because most people cannot even laugh simply out of sheer joy, you have to tickle them. Even if you tickle them in that, they're judging what's a good joke and a bad joke and getting angry about some joke that they don't like. Because they think it was attacked, something that they believe in, that they're identified with. It is just a device. It's just a device to make a point. Because if the same thing is told to you in utmost seriousness, you will make a dogma out of it, which is very dangerous. The idea is, see people are always looking, there's… Uh, in the end, people will ask, all this is fine, but what's the takeaway? They want a commandment. We are talking about consciousness. Commandments won't fly. Commandments means you're trying to fix your life. Consciousness means you want to liberate your life. My intention is, you must liberate your life. People come and say, Sadhguru, please teach us how to control my mind. So you want your mind controlled or liberated? Oh, yes, yes, liberated, but how to control? Because they think that intelligence is a serious problem and it's been in their lives. So what is the solution? If you remove a part of your brain, you will be fine. <laughs> You're es essentially complaining, I wish I had the brain of an earthworm, this human brain I'm not able to handle. Yes, that is a fact. See, according to Charles Darwin, he's an Englishman, okay? It's not me <laughs> Charles Darwin said that you evolved out of a monkey. You were a monkey, then you became a man. Some of the neuro neuroscientists today are studying, uh, I mean, uh, genetic scientists are saying this, that the difference, the DNA difference between a chimpanzee and you is only 1.23 percent. So in that sense, physiologically you're only 1.23 percent away from a chimpanzee. Not a big difference, isn't it? A shade, it's just a shade of difference. But in terms of intelligence and awareness, you are worlds apart from a chimpanzee. So your problem is just this, you have an intelligence for which you don't have a stable enough platform and that's why yoga, to create a stable platform so that your intelligence works for you. Right now, you may call it so many things, so many exotic names have come up, stress, tension, anxiety, depression, madness, all kinds of things. All this essentially what it means is, your intelligence has turned against you, that's all. You can give any number of reasons, but essentially your intelligence has turned against you. If your intelligence was working for you, would you create blissfulness or misery? What's this all. Why your intelligence has turned against you? There's no stable enough base. So the entire yogic system is about this that you create a stable base so that your intelligence works for you. If your intelligence turns against you, no power in the universe is going to save you, you are a done thing. One of the things that can help you stop procrastinating, well, let's say two things, I referred to them at the end of my talk. One is to have a really nicely developed vision of heaven. It's like, okay, here's what you need to know. How would your life be, what would it be like if it was really good? And I, I don't, don't get primitive about that. It's not like, you know, naked supermodels on a yacht. <laughs> They're too skinny anyways. <laughs> anyways, you know what I mean. It's like, yeah, yeah, that's, I get it, but it's, 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 it's not agape, say. So it, it's, it's not sophisticated enough to be self-sustaining. It's, it's a stupid vision, and if you pursue it, it's, you're just going to be on a sinking yacht with, like, anorexics or something like that. <laughs> um, so you need, a vision, you need a vision of what your life would be like if it was just the way it should be, if it was best for you, and if you were taking care of yourself with this thing that you kind of described as parental love. Mm -hmm. It's a really good way of thinking about it because it's nice and concrete. So what would be best for you? three to five years down the road if you were really taking care of yourself like you were someone that you thought should be around. And people are very ambivalent about whether they should be around, so this is a lot harder than you think. So you need that vision. And then what you also need is a vision of what your life would be like if you let yourself deteriorate in precisely the foolish ways that you know that you would deteriorate if you let yourself go. And that's contemplation too. It's like, okay, if I let myself go, 
where would I end up? And first of all, this is kind of a shadow realization from a Jungian perspective. It's like, first of all, you could let yourself go. Mm. Second of all, you already know exactly how you do it if you did do it. And third, with a little imagination, you can conjure up exactly what that would be like, not only for you, but for your family and for the broader social community. And that would be the whole bloody catastrophe, including all the malevolence that would go along with your deterioration and so on. And so then you've got these stark choices before you. One is agape-oriented equilibration, for lack of a, a better technical phrase, and the other is something that more closely approximate hell, approximates hell than people even think, because if you sink low enough, not only do you sink that low, but you are absolutely motivated to drag people down there with you.